Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, TikTok has been completely blindsided by the US bill that now could ban it. In fact, it looks like it's actually banning TikTok. This, this thing that sometime was talked about, it was suggested it could possibly happen, is now officially happening. TikTok is likely to be banned, and we're gonna look at the fallout of what would happen here. There's various reasonings behind this. There's senators like Ted Cruz that say that TikTok is a spying app for the Chinese. There's so much distrust of TikTok based on it being such an important app that deals with so many kids and it being owned by China. It's already passed the House, and now the bill's going on to the Senate. If the Senate passes this bill, President Biden has already said that he supports it. So if it passed the bill, this is a done deal. TikTok will be banned. It'll have to shut down operations or be sold to a U.S. firm. We're going to look at the potential outcome of this bill passing. What happens with TikTok? Who are the potential buyers? Is it Microsoft, Amazon? We'll be looking at what companies are most likely to purchase TikTok and which companies are most likely to get harmed by retaliations from the Chinese government. In my portfolio, I own many companies that have some level of operations in China. For example, Apple does some business in China and there are potential consequences for this bill passing. Now, of course, we have some other news to get to. The CEO of Palantir, Alex Karp, went on to CNBC in an unhinged interview, suggesting that short sellers are Coke fanatics addicted to Coke and all they like to do is take down great American companies. We'll be responding to his comments here. And Boeing is now in crisis mode. The airline has stopped its flights, it's paused hirings, and the CEO is trying to get control of this company that just a while ago had one of the whistleblowers of the company found dead in his own car. So we'll be talking about this news as well. So we have a lot of news to get to in this episode. Let's go ahead and jump in. Before we get into the headline news, which is the TikTok ban, I first wanna give a quick portfolio update. This is the passive income portfolio. It's what I followed on this channel since the very beginning in 2019. So for over five years, you've been able to see how this portfolio has performed, what I'm buying and what I'm selling. And I'll continue to show it transparently, come good or bad. So you'll be able to see the progress over time if you're subscribed. Now, today we've actually reached an all-time high in the portfolio gains. And we're actually in the green today, even though the market is in the red across the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So how is my portfolio in the green when the rest of the market's in the red? Well, that comes down to one company today. One company is up quite a bit and it's in the restaurant category. I know, I know, I talk about this one a lot, but it's just been on such a roll. Texas Roadhouse, the company's up big today. It's up around 3% today, up to $155 on again, a day that the market is red, both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Now that rarely happens. So there has to be some type of catalyst that caused it to go up. And there is a research firm, Baird, upgraded Texas Roadhouse's price target. They set a new price target of 175, arguing that there's plenty of room for this company to run, even when factoring in the recent strength. The reasoning's simple for this big upgrade. They highlight that out of all the various restaurants in the stock market, Texas Roadhouse is one of, if not the strongest. Quote, for company operated restaurants in 2024, same store traffic performance will become an increasingly important determinant of the direction of profitability. And Texas Roadhouse arguably has amongst the strongest outlook in this metric. They are correct there. Out of the companies that I look at and their ability to grow same store sales consistently, Texas Roadhouse is the very top. It's not one of, it is the top restaurant. Unless you go into the category of quick service restaurants, which are a bit different, Texas Roadhouse is by far the strongest. They say, furthermore, the combination of continued unit growth, 5% annually, and healthy comps should support annual revenue increasing above 10% plus in the upcoming years. I agree with this as well. I think Texas Roadhouse can continue to grow in double digits. They say that a potential problem with this price target could be an elongated beef inflation cycle that could limit earnings growth and beyond. If you talk to Texas Roadhouse or you listen to their earnings call, they mention that they don't price things based on beef inflation because they view that almost always cyclical. Beef prices go up and they go down. They never stay one direction for too long. So Texas Roadhouse being up a couple thousand dollars today has kept my portfolio in the green for the day. Now let's go ahead and move on to TikTok being banned. It looks like this is becoming a reality, or at least it's getting much, much closer to it. And this may have come as a surprise to many of you because just a month ago, it seemed like TikTok had already passed this challenge. They were over this hurdle. They had dodged a bullet and they felt like they were no longer in the crosshairs. So this was a shock to TikTok. 
and they expressed how much of a surprise this was. Two weeks ago, executives from TikTok's U.S. operations flew to their company's international headquarters in Singapore with good news. They told the bosses that after years of battling over its fate in the U.S., the popular video app wasn't in imminent danger of being banned in its most important market. According to people familiar with the meetings, among the positive signs, President Biden's election campaign had just joined the app on Super Bowl Sunday. So they flew over to their headquarters in Singapore, with a big sigh of relief saying that they're no longer getting banned. And even the president, who has the ultimate say on this bill, he is on TikTok now, so there's really nothing to worry about. Then days after returning in the US, they learned that they had miscalculated. Behind the scenes in Washington, a bipartisan group of lawmakers and Biden administration officials have been quietly planning new legislation to ban TikTok or force its sale to a non-Chinese owner. The legislation was a culmination of more than a year-long effort to curb TikTok by a coalition of China hawks in Washington and Silicon Valley. And it had gained new momentum in part because of the anger over TikTok's videos about the Israel-Hamas conflict. So part of this has politics at play. The content on TikTok is heavily pro-Hamas. It's not nearly as pro-Israel. When lawmakers went public last week with their plans, the broad support for the bill caught TikTok by surprise. So they were surprised, but not pleased by this. They said that this was a process that was intentionally conducted in secret because the bill authors knew it was the only way they could move it forward. That's what a TikTok spokesperson said. So this entire anti-TikTok bill was formed over the past year, and it was a complete surprise to TikTok, which raises one question that I have thought about, which is, wouldn't TikTok know about the bill being formed if China had any type of insight into what our lawmakers are doing? Apparently they have no spies in Congress or people working there because they were genuinely surprised by it. They had just flown back to celebrate that TikTok was no longer in the crosshairs. So at least it shows that China wasn't able to anticipate this bill being passed. Now, where do we go from there? The TikTok bill was formed and it has to pass the House and Senate and be approved by the president. Well, it already got past the first big hurdle. The House passed the bill to ban TikTok and forced the sale to lobbyists. Now it turns its attention to the Senate. Asked how the chamber would handle the measure, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has declined to say if they would bring it up for a vote. Schumer said that he would consult with Democratic committee chairman, quote, to see what their views would be. President Biden has said he would sign the bill if it got to his desk. So basically, if President Biden is already on board, he signaled that he is going to stamp the approval of this bill, he's not going to block it. All that means is that the only thing left for this bill to pass is the Senate. That's it. It's already through the House. It's already through the President. It just has to pass the Senate. So this is very close to being banned, and it raises the question of what does this mean for different social media companies? Well, I think, first of all, to understand the impact this will have, we have to understand how big TikTok is. It is a top social media company. It is massive. In the US alone, it has over 150 million active users. And most of those users are in a demographic where they're pretty young. For example, around 17% are 12 to 17 years old. And then around another 23% are 18 to 24. So you have around 30% of those 150 million being between 12 to 24 years old. This is young adults in the US. Now you have another big age demographic between 25 to 34, and it starts to fall off there above age 44. It goes down quite a bit. But overall, TikTok skews to a very young audience, and that is part of the biggest criticism of this app. It's Chinese owned, and it skews to a younger audience. That combination of being Chinese owned and being skewed heavily towards younger people in the US has a lot of people worried. Senator Ted Cruz breaks down the biggest concerns people have over TikTok. Uh, I am deeply concerned about TikTok. I've been very vocal about my concerns in TikTok. We had the CEO of TikTok testify before the Judiciary Committee just a few weeks ago, and, and I vigorously question him really on two fronts I'm concerned about TikTok. Number one, I'm concerned about Chinese surveillance and espionage. TikTok is controlled by the Chinese Communist government. It is, has 170 million users in the United States, and it gives the Chinese government the ability to monitor, number one, what they're saying, number two, their physical location using GPS, number three, potentially what they're searching for and what they're doing with their phone. 
all of that is concerning. We also know that China has used it to target journalists in particular going after them on TikTok. So the first thing he brings up as a major concern is surveillance. We know that modern apps like TikTok basically collect every bit of data about you that they can. That's how their algorithm works so effectively to draw you in and make the product addictive. They know how old you are, they know your interests, they know where you are. They can get your location from it and they can track your behavior even off of TikTok into other apps. There's lots of things that they can do with just having that one app on your phone. Now, Ted Cruz, of course, is Republican. He's conservative, but he goes on to describe what I believe both parties feel is the biggest concern for TikTok, which is his concern number two. The second set of concerns is the propaganda that the Chinese government pushes on TikTok and pushes in particular at kids. And I think it is deeply, deeply harmful. You know, you look right now at, at the Israel-Hamas war that is unfolding. Every age cohort of Americans, when asked who's in the right, who do you side with, overwhelmingly Americans side with Israel except for one age co cohort, and, and that is 18 to 29, and, and we see TikTok in particular pushing pro-Hamas propaganda. I think it is deliberate. I think that is designed by the Chinese government, and, and so I'm glad the House is acting right. to, to address what I think are very serious risks. He notes another huge concern about TikTok is not just their surveillance, but their control over the algorithm and what younger people in the U.S. see. The age demographic of 12 to 17 and 18 to 24 are two demographics that are the most impressionable to news and social media. Your frontal lobe, which is your judgment, your ability to make executive decisions, is not even fully developed until age 25. So around half the users of TikTok are younger, impressionable users that are being heavily influenced by an algorithm. An algorithm that is controlled, not by the US or any US company, but by a Chinese company. An algorithm that they will not make public. So here you see the two central complaints that the US has around TikTok, surveillance and control of the algorithm, which could potentially be used for propaganda. Now, some people may say that although TikTok may be bad or maybe it's being used as propaganda, is it really all that different than companies like Facebook or Instagram? that they also have their own controlled algorithms that may favor certain views. I think protecting free speech online is critically important, but Joe, there's a difference. As much as I don't like what, what Google or YouTube or Facebook does, they are American country companies. They are not owned and controlled by the Chinese government. And it's not simply the algorithm. Let me give you some data from a recent study comparing different hashtags on TikTok versus comparing them on Instagram. The hashtag Tibet was 30 times more common on Instagram than on TikTok. The hashtag Uyghur was eight to one on Instagram versus, versus TikTok. The hashtag Tiananmen Square was 57 to one on Instagram versus TikTok. And this one's the one that's most compelling. The hashtag Hong Kong protests was 174 to one more likely to appear on Instagram than TikTok. That's not accidental. That is deliberate. That is clearly, I believe, driven by the Chinese government because they want to suppress speech they don't like. Now, this may not be a perfect science comparing hashtags from one app to the other, but the underlying complaint that the Chinese government has a tendency to censor certain information is certainly a valid concern. And this is where it stems from. The concerns against TikTok are valid on the surface. China's no stranger to banning US properties. They've banned Google, YouTube, Facebook, Wikipedia, Reddit. They block Netflix, they block Disney Plus, they block Bing, Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitch, Roblox, Steam, Messenger, Twitter, so on and so forth. And they'll certainly block or minimize any information that makes the government look bad. So the grounding of the concerns here are real. One of the founders of this bill says the bill is not about censorship. It's about the inverse of censorship, which is propaganda and foreign propaganda pitting Americans against Americans or deprioritizing certain hashtag subject matter that is problematic. So they mention again the algorithm and the ability of TikTok to deprioritize or emphasize certain hashtags or trending topics. Now, if this bill does pass the Senate and it does end up getting banned, there are going to be winners and losers. Last year, TikTok generated around $6 billion in advertising revenue. That revenue is going to go somewhere else. It's not just going to completely disappear. One of the biggest beneficiaries that people will think of is Meta. I think Meta will benefit from it slightly. They'll have additional users on Instagram and possibly Facebook. 
but I don't see that as a one-for-one -one match. I think that Meta will benefit slightly. I do not believe that Meta could buy TikTok. I don't think that legislators would let them buy it if it goes up for sale. It would be too much of a monopoly over social media. When I think of which companies could buy TikTok, I believe that Microsoft is one of the top ones. Microsoft already owns a very large social media company, which is LinkedIn. It's more of a professional one, but Satya Nadella has already expressed a lot of interest in owning TikTok. The last time that it looked like it was going up for sale, he said that he would be bidding for it. He was very interested in it. Another company that could potentially benefit is Oracle. If they end up buying it, that could be a different growth path for them. They seem like an unlikely match, but they were one of the bidders last time. And then I think another likely candidate, another company that would be very interested in owning TikTok would be Amazon. Amazon views TikTok as a potential threat to their business, a company that does a lot of marketing and sales, and they've already done business partnerships with Shopify. So. Amazon is in this business of e-commerce, which a lot of TikTok creators create products that sell on e-commerce. So it would be a natural fit for Amazon. I could see them heavily integrating a property like TikTok into Amazon's e-commerce and fulfillment. And of course, it would be very easy to host TikTok with AWS. So Amazon would be a very natural fit with TikTok. So this is another company that I think would be a big bidder if it went up for sale. So any of those companies could be winners. When I think about the biggest potential losers of retaliation from the Chinese government, already the government has become a little bit more strict with Apple, but I think if the US government does go through with forcing the sale or banning TikTok, I believe they will retaliate some way against Apple. I have no clue how, maybe they won't, but I have a feeling they will. I just think it's something they're going to do. China has shown that they will take retaliatory measures. So that's what we know as of right now with the TikTok ban. We'll continue to follow this as it goes through the Senate. Now, moving on, I have to comment on this interview. We have the CEO of Palantir, who is Alex Karp, going on an interview with CNBC this morning. And, you know, a lot of the interview is fine. I don't really have a problem with what he was saying up until it got to one part. One specific part of this interview he tries to give a little bit of a depiction of how he views short sellers and short selling. If you're not familiar, short selling is betting against a company, believing the stock price will go down. Here's how Alex Karp views short sellers. But you're you know, burning the short sellers. I love burning the short sellers. Like almost <laughs> sure nothing makes a human happier than taking the lines of cocaine and uh, <laughs> away from these short sellers who like are going short on a truly great American company, not just ours, but just love pulling down great American companies so that they can pay for their Coke. And I, the best thing that could happen to them is we will provide, we will lead their Coke dealers to their homes after they can't pay their bills. <laughs> and that that's like one of my- Surely all short sellers- Yeah, well, you know, go ahead, habits. do your thing, we'll do our thing. So. <laughs> Short sellers are apparently coked up drug addicts that just snort lines of coke as they short and destroy great American companies. Okay, this is this is something that I think I think it appeals well to a lot of people. A lot of people that are long a stock view anyone that's short a stock as the bitter enemy, some type of enemy, and they must be these people with very dubious morals. They must have some type of drug addiction, they're in it for the short run, right? And they wanna bring down great American corporations like Palantir. There's a lot of things wrong with this depiction of short sellers. The first thing I'll address is that he says specifically that short sellers bring down great American corporations. That has never, ever been the case. You've never had short sellers destroying any great American corporation ever throughout history. In fact, if I was if I was there interviewing Alex Karp and he suggested that short sellers destroy or bring down American corporations, I'd ask him which one. Name one single great American corporation that has had permanent damage done to it by short selling. Because I can't think of a single example. The way that Alex Karp treats short sellers is in a very defensive fashion. He's threatened by them, saying that they're bringing down companies and they have dubious morals. Compare that type of action to the way that Warren Buffett treats short sellers. But I've never, I, I do not see the problem at all with, with people shorting stocks. I mean, I, I would welcome people shorting Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, it, it, uh, if you own stock and they need to borrow from you, you can get some extra income from your stock. And the one sure buyer of your stock eventually is somebody who shorted it. I mean, that guy's gonna buy it someday. Uh, and I have no 
I have no problem with, with shorts. If there's some kind of a game that's played, uh, uh, and I've read about it, I've never seen it happen to anything that we've owned. Uh, like I say, if anybody wants the naked short Berkshire Hathaway, they can do it till the cows come home, and, and we'll, be, uh, we'll be happy to, and we'll have a special meeting for them. Uh, but he says that he invites people to short a stock. He'll throw a special meeting for them. And he'd love taking the income in interest and allowing people to borrow those shares, short the stocks, and then eventually have to buy it back. This is a response from a place of complete confidence. Buffett doesn't care about short sellers. Why should he? They can't hurt him. They're only future buyers of the stock. They make no difference in the long run. And he doesn't believe there's anything wrong with it. So I had to mention this because I don't like this ongoing animosity towards short sellers. I actually think that short sellers play an important role in the market, which is that they can balance out and make prices more fair. If a company has a massive run up in valuation like Palantir has, where it trades at extremely high multiples of free cash flow, of PE, or based on its price to sales, whatever metric you may take, the company's at a very high price. So there may be some short sellers that are not coke addicts, they're not trying to bring down a great American corporation, they're simply just wanting to balance out a portfolio by taking a short stance on a company that trades at a high valuation. And there's nothing ethically wrong with that. Now finally we get to the news of Boeing. This is an ongoing disaster that's really been ongoing for a number of years now. It started off with the MCAS system causing one plane to crash, Boeing deciding that nothing was wrong with their planes, uh, allowing all of the 747 Maxes to continue to fly, and then six months later, another one crashing for the exact same reason. After 300 people died, they finally decided it was time to investigate properly, and they found that it was indeed a problem caused by Boeing and their rushed safety protocols. They did not properly test the software, they did not release a proper update. So it was Boeing's fault, and now we have, years later, more and more problems with Boeing and their safety protocols. Boeing's latest max crisis is forcing some of its biggest customers to rethink their growth plans this year and possibly beyond, several airline CEOs said on Tuesday. Their comments highlight how Boeing's top buyers have felt the effects of the problems, snowballing quality control issues, a slow increase of output and certification of new aircrafts that is running years behind on schedule. So everything that can be a mess is a mess with Boeing. They have planes where they're not only falling out of the sky, but some of them are having big dips right after takeoff that are a little bit frightening. One of them had a door completely fall off, which of course is not optimal. If someone had been sitting in that seat, they may have been sucked right out of the airplane, which is incredibly scary just to think about. And then the latest scandal just happening last week was that a whistleblower for Boeing's quality control problems was found dead in his vehicle as the trial was taking place. Upon their arrival, officers discovered a male inside a vehicle suffering from a gunshot wound to the head. Now the officers said that it appears to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound, but given the dramatic incentives for this whistleblower to suddenly disappear and not be able to testify, well, it's raised a few questions. You know, all of this reminds me of why one of the biggest things I look for in companies that I either want to invest in or not invest in is the operational complexity of the company. How difficult of a company is it to run? When we look at Boeing, we have a company that deals with manufacturing of jets. Possibly the most difficult thing to manufacture that they have to do across different states, requiring so much talent. And then the safety standards, the protocols for safety are incredibly high. If they make any mistakes at all, it's incredibly high profile where the consequences are devastating for the stock. When I judge the operational complexity of companies, Boeing is more operationally complex than any company in my portfolio, by far. It holds more operational risks than any company in my portfolio. So no matter what you look at with the market cap or free cash flow yield or profit margins, the beta of the stock, none of that really makes a difference when you have a stock that's so difficult to predict. For me, this is in the basket of too difficult of a company to run. So I'm not gonna be investing in Boeing. I'm not gonna be buying the dip. This is one that I'll be looking at from the sidelines. Now that's gonna be it for today. If you enjoyed this episode, you can check out the Patreon. It's $10 a month. You gain access to over 100 episodes, Qualtrum.com, which is the software analysis tool I use. And of course it comes with a free trial. So I'll see you there. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.